Thank you for joining us for Gathering Credible Data. My name is Shayla Thompson, and I will be leading today's session. I'm a graduate from the University of Washington School of Public Health with a concentration in community-oriented public health practice. I've spent the greater part of the last year volunteering with the Urban Indian Health Institute here in Seattle, and I'm happy to have you here with us. For future viewing purposes, this webinar will be recorded and archived on the UIHI project website. Once again, thank you and welcome for joining us here today. The objectives of this session are to describe how data collection fits into program evaluation, to discuss general principles of data collection, discuss considerations for selecting the right data collection methods for you, and to give an overview of qualitative and quantitative data collection methods. I will present for about half an hour, and then we'll open the line up for questions and comments at the end of the webinar. So please be sure to write your questions down as we go along, or you can also submit them using the chat feature. Now, when you close out of this webinar, an evaluation survey will appear on your screen. I would greatly appreciate it if everyone would complete that survey, as it, important, as it is important for us to improve future webinar sessions. Uh, the survey is very brief, it's about one to two minutes, and so that I would be very grateful. Now, before we discuss data collection methods, it will be helpful for us to have a common definition of evaluation and understand how data collection fits into program evaluation. Now, as you see here, evaluation is defined as a systematic way of collecting information about the characteristics, activities, products, and outcomes of a program to make judgments, make improvements, inform decisions, and improve understanding. However, evaluation can also answer seemingly basic questions, such as what are we doing or what happened? What difference did it make or what did we accomplish? And now, what are we going to do? There are also many uses for evaluation, such as program improvement, improving accountability, can help with grant writing and fundraising, can help to inform policy, describe the program and its impact, or simply to help us meet program reporting requirements. Now, this slide shows the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Framework for planning and conducting evaluation. It's comprised of six different steps, all of which are necessary for a useful evaluation. As each part, each step is a part of an ongoing learning cycle. Today, we will focus on step four, gathering credible evidence. By discussing the different types of data collection methods and providing a few examples of how to use select methods to effectively answer evaluation questions. Now, by step four, we have already defined the different aspects of our program and have an understanding of what each element is intended to achieve based on the logic model we have developed to describe our program. We have also identified the type of evaluation we want to conduct and have developed questions to help us understand if the program is working, why or why not it is working, and to measure specific indicators that are appropriate and relevant. Data collection is the stage of the evaluation process where we gather the information necessary to answer our evaluation questions. Let's begin by discussing some general guiding principles to follow throughout the data collection process. First, it is important that when we assess various aspects of a program, to place them within the context of relationship, community, and culture. When we conduct a program evaluation within this context, we place respect for clients as a priority. Now, there are many ways we can show respect for clients throughout the evaluation process. The simple approaches that demonstrate respect for clients are by clearly and honestly communicating why data is being collected, how the data will be used, and who will have access to this data. You want to be transparent about the purpose of the evaluation. Also, you want to ensure the evaluation being conducted is culturally responsive by acknowledging the importance of attending to the influence of race, gender, class, and other factors that might be dismissed, so they are central elements of an individual's lived experiences and reality. A culturally responsive evaluation validates and empowers the inclusion of culturally specific knowledge, also known as indigenous ways of knowing. You also want to address questions about participating in evaluation efforts and inform people of any possible disruptions regarding access to services and continued participation in programs. 
You want to inform clients of how you plan to protect their privacy or, when possible, ensure confidentiality. Lastly, inform all participants and stakeholders who have ownership of the data collected during the evaluation and how findings will be reported back to the community. So what exactly do you need to consider to decide which data collection method will work best for your program evaluation? Now, there are many things to consider, but here are four questions we should ask ourselves before moving forward with the decision. First, what is the information that you need? What type of data will best answer your evaluation questions? Are there specific measures that you're required to report for funding purposes? Consider information, consider what information is needed that is different from what is already available. Secondly, where is the information? Now, the most common sources of evaluation information are existing documents, people, and observations. So once you have identified who or where you need to collect data from, consider what is the most efficient way to access information. For data collection methods that require engaging program participants, consider the most effective and appropriate communication channels. For data collection methods that rely on existing documents, consider the most efficient way to retrieve the information. Next, how much time is needed to collect the data? Now, while some methods are readily available, have readily available tools that have been tested for accuracy, others will need to be tested for validity, which measures how well a test actually measures what it claims to, and reliability, that a test in, is consistent in measuring what it is intended to measure. It is important to create a timeline that includes developing tools and setting collection protocols. And finally, what resources are available for data collection? Now, resources can include available funding to train staff who will be collecting the data or hiring skilled experts who work outside the organization to gather the same data. Now, resources can also include computer software, mailing supplies, and volunteers who will aid in the process of collecting data. Additional considerations should include thinking about what challenges you may encounter and how to overcome them. Now, some common issues that can limit participation in program evaluation at the community level include low literacy levels, language barriers, access to computers or internet, and skepticism about how the information you're gathering will be used. Most of these barriers can be overcome with careful planning and seeking staff input about addressing these issues. Now, with these questions in mind, let's turn to looking at some specific data collection methods. Now, data collection can take place anywhere. We can use this picture here of patients at a community clinic to demonstrate how information can be gathered and how to distinguish between the two common types of data. That's described as either qualitative or quantitative. Now, qualitative methods measure quality and collect descriptive information. Data tend to be subjective, and findings for program evaluation are usually reported as themes or vignettes. Now, some examples of qualitative measures can be descriptions about the waiting room that can be seen, heard, or otherwise observed. In contrast, quantitative methods measure quantity and collect data that can be counted or expressed numerically. Now, quantitative data is usually reported in the form of rates, proportions, and percentages. And some examples of quantitative measures could include the number of staff present, the proportion of user elders, or the number of chairs in the room. Both qualitative and quantitative methods provide information that can be used to learn more about people's knowledge, perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs. Both methods can also be used to assess the process and outcomes of programs, interventions, or services. Now, we're going to review some of the most common qualitative and quantitative collection methods, beginning with qualitative methods first. Now, first, we're going to discuss interviews. Now, interviews are individual, in-depth conversations that can be used to understand how a specific intervention or participation in a program has impacted an individual for outcome evaluations. It can also be used for process evaluation to understand how participants experience an intervention. Now, similar to interviews are focus groups. 
which are small facilitated discussions that allow you to collect descriptive data about a specific topic. Now, similar to interviews, you can collect this in-depth information, but you can also do so from multiple people at once. Now, the purpose of conducting a focus group is not to reach consensus among participants, but rather to stimulate conversation and gain insight about people's experiences and perceptions. Another qualitative data collection method is creative expression and storytelling, which offers a rich exploratory process that allows you to observe and analyze the influence of your program has on the participants. Now, this approach to data collection recognizes that credible evidence goes beyond just words. Now, some examples of creative expression include photo voice, digital storytelling, and creative arts for healing, such as, such as traditional Native art activities. And finally, participant observation, which involves gathering information about a program as the program's activities occur. But the goal of participant observation to assess the daily implementation plans or observe skills and behaviors learned in an intervention. Now let's shoot forward and look at some common quantitative methods. <clears throat> First up, observation checklists. An observation checklist or like a shopping list, which help you to know what you're looking for and to check them off. Observation checklists can help evaluate what actions take place during programming or service processes in order to assess the services or activities are being carried out as planned. Now, the purpose of observation checklists is to count how many times a specific measurable action takes place during program or service delivery, daily workflow tasks, or can also be used to assess a skill or behavior. Now, this method of data collection can inform why or why not an outcome objective is being reached. It's particularly well suited for process or implementation evaluation. Another method is document review, which is the process of collecting and reviewing existing documents to analyze information about the organization's activities and the population being served. Now, document review can help track changes or identified indicators in existing records, such as changes in health status. They can also track other information, like the number of visits. Document review can also include content analysis of emails or meeting minutes to identify whether activities and processes related to program implementation were actually accomplished. Another quantitative method are surveys, which use standardized tools to measure an individual's characteristics, behaviors, knowledge, perceptions, attitudes, or beliefs. Surveys also allow you to gather descriptive data from a large group of people relatively quickly. And surveys can either be done on paper, online, administered by an interviewer, even a person, or over the phone. So there's lots of flexibility with this type of um, collection method. Another quantitative method, which is a slight modification on the standard survey, are pre and post tests, which offer a simple way to measure changes in knowledge. Now, this assessment approach works by comparing what an individual knew before participation through a pretest and answers to the same test after the intervention. Now, pre and post tests can be matched to breakable models and are ideal to and are ideal to evaluate a change in knowledge or improvement in skill performance over a period of time. Now, pre and post tests can link changes more directly to the program intervention than a single test, which basically captures information at one specific point in time. And lastly, there are biomedical markers, also known as biomarkers, which are distinct biochemical, genetic, or molecular characteristic or substance, substances that act as an indicator of biological conditions or biological processes. Now, biomarkers can include blood, saliva, body tissue, or urine. Now, some common examples of using biomarkers in program evaluation are A1C tests that measure blood glucose levels to assess diabetes intervention, or urine tests that can detect abstinence from substance abuse. Now, so far, we've introduced a variety of qualitative and quantitative methods individually to basically show what each method is capable of um, achieving in terms of data collection and what are some of the strengths of each approach. Now, while one data collection method conducted very well can produce credible data, 
Here, we're going to discuss the benefits of using a mixed method approach for data collection. Now, generally, a mixed method approach uses two or more methods. Combining multiple methods are able to increase your understanding of processes and outcomes by integrating different ways of knowing. Now, using a combination of data collection methods also improves evaluation by balancing the limitations of one type of data by the strengths of another. A mixed method approach can include two or more qualitative or quantitative methods. For example, if we want to learn about the barriers that limit clients from accessing substance abuse treatment services, we could hold focus groups with staff and conduct interviews with clients. Together, the two qualitative methods would gather valuable information from different viewpoints that can help identify possible solutions to overcome client barriers to, assessing, to accessing substance abuse treatment. Likewise, if we want to assess if implementation plans to improve client access to substance abuse treatment services are being followed as planned, we use a combination of quantitative methods such as document reviews and survey. Together, these two quantitative methods can help staff identify if the changes they have implemented have been affected in decreasing the barriers clients face in attempting to access substance abuse treatment. Now, another purpose of combining data collection methods is to confirm or to reject initial or unexpected findings from qualitative or quantitative work. This is known as triangulation. Now, with triangulation, triangulation both qualitative and quantitative data collection methods are used simultaneously, with the methods building credibility in your evaluation findings because you're able to provide explanations of your findings. Now, qualitative data provides depth that complements more general findings that are generally found in quantitative data. Furthermore, mixed methodology allows for a diversity of viewpoints to be presented, reflecting relationships and meaning related to processes and outcomes. Now, there are multiple combinations of data testing methods you can decide to use. Just be sure to plan in advance of how you will integrate the two methods, or have a plan for how each selected method will build upon the previous one and improve your evaluation efforts. Now, as a recap for the simple steps we can take for selecting the best method, we want to keep in mind that the various data testing methods and mixed method evaluation approaches provide numerous ways to gather the information that you need to answer your specific evaluation questions. Keep in mind that the questions we choose to ask drive the indicators we examine, how we collect data, and ultimately, the information we receive, which in turn will drive our actions. Now, once you have determined your evaluation questions, then you'll have to consider the appropriate indicators you can measure to gather the information necessary to answer your questions. Now, in program evaluation, indicators are tangible things we can see, hear, or read that demonstrate the outcome. For example, process indicators monitor the implementation of the program as well as the program input. Process indicators monitor how well the program is implemented, if it is reaching the intended target population, and if it is, and if it is of acceptable quality. The process indicators may include things like client satisfaction of a number of participants in a class. On the other hand, outcome indicators are used to assess if the program outcomes or goals have been achieved and are therefore more likely to include active behavior, such as health status and quality of life. The data collection method that we select should be the best approach that will lead us to gather the information we need to answer our evaluation questions. We should keep in mind the most efficient way to collect the data we need, considering the amount of time needed, cost, and available resources. Now next, we have provided a few scenarios to help you practice weighing the considerations for selecting the appropriate data collection methods based on a given evaluation question and a list of indicators. So let's move forward together and go through these practice interviews. So let's say we are conducting a process evaluation for our gathering of Native American activities. Because we want to assess outreach activities, we want to assess what outreach activities have the greatest reach for our community-based substance abuse prevention activities to report to our board of directors. Now, as you see here, staff could have brainstormed a list of indicators they felt are good signs of effectiveness 
of their gathering of Native American outreach efforts. Now, think about the data collection methods we introduced earlier in today's session. What approach do you think is most effective and efficient in answering this evaluation question? For this given scenario, document review would be appropriate because evaluators could refer to items such as attendance laws, summary reports of outreach activities, materials used for outreach, and even website or social media activity to evaluate the effectiveness of outreach activities to recruit youth to participate in SONA activities to prevent substance abuse. Now, document review requires clearly defining the data that you are seeking, looking through the records that store that information, and then quantifying the number of times a specific measurable action occurred. For example, with, that, with document review, staff could analyze how many youth sign up to join their listserv when completing community-based outreach activities at different locations. And document review would be great also to assess implementation plans for activities or programs as they were carried out. It's kind of give an idea of which plans were more successful and which ones were least successful. And now, while there are multiple approaches to gather the data that you need to collect, you could possibly consider data document review because you want to opt for the method that will best answer your evaluation question but also has the least burden on clients and staff in which you already have the resources to gather and analyze. Now let's try one more exercise together for weighing the considerations for selecting a data collection method. Now for this scenario, let's say we are evaluating a short-term outcome of clients maintaining sobriety after discharge from inpatient substance abuse treatment because we want to identify challenges to maintaining sobriety following treatment in order to improve aftercare support. Now, based on a list of indicators presented, which data collection method covered in today's session is the most effective and efficient approach to gather information about clients to answer our evaluation question? Now, conducting a focus group with current program participants and active care services is a good method to answer this type of evaluation question. As I mentioned before, a focus group moderator could ask participants about the challenges they face while striving to maintain their sobriety, particularly how they are managing their stress while abstaining from alcohol and substance abuse. Now, once again, focus groups provide a relatively cheap, quick way to gather qualitative data from multiple people at once. In this scenario, a focus group would offer in-depth information about the coping skills they perceive to be the most helpful in maintaining sobriety and how they have managed their self-care throughout the process. Now, during the focus group, the moderator would be able to ask questions and use probes to stimulate conversation about each person's unique stressors and how they are coping with those challenges. Collectively, their feedback can help program supervisors and administrators to integrate coping skills perceived to be the most helpful into their active care services and programs. Now today, we briefly introduced a lot of information on the principles of data collection and things to consider when choosing a data collection method, as well as qualitative and quantitative methods. Now the most important principle to remember when collecting data is respect. This includes respecting the people or places from which we are collecting the data by clearly communicating the purpose and uses of the evaluation and what will happen to their data. Respect also includes respect for the largest community by ensuring that your program evaluation is culturally responsive, keeping the needs, strengths, priorities, and interests of the community at heart. You also want to be sure to choose the best method that fits your evaluation question. Remember that both qualitative and quantitative methods can provide valuable information when conducted as well. Also, consider using a mixed method approach, which offers the benefit of enhancing the strength and balancing out the weaknesses of each approach, and will increase the validity and add depth to your findings. The information needed to answer your evaluation questions, where or who has information, your available resources, and how much time you have should drive your method selection. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And at this time, I'm going to open the lineup for questions or comments. And I'd also like to mention that you can join us again next week here at the same time 
for our final installment for our evaluation curriculum here for analyzing collection data, data collection. So I just want to open the line for questions and comments and discussion. And at the end of this slide, you will also find a list of resources that can help for um, understanding more of the data collection methods presented here, as well as others that we're not able to present, as well as the webinar survey, which will appear once we close out of this webinar, which once again, we would greatly appreciate it if you take one or two minutes to fill that out upon exiting your screen. Okay, well, this concludes today's session. Uh, once again, I'd like to put out there that UIHI staff are offering individual consultation on program evaluations for staff at the Urban Indian Health, at Urban Indian Health Organizations. So please contact Julie Logren to find out more about this free service. Um, she can be reached with the information cited here on this. Thank you and have a good day.